nice to see some teachers and Emma grooving like me to that in the background. That was fantastic. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got some new folks joining us today, and so welcome in from around the world. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, we've got two big things going on in May. One just wrapped up last weekend, and that was our Global Biodiversity Festival. You can check that out at globalbiofest.com. We are slowly but surely taking every one of the 150 presentations we did, over 72 two straight hours of broadcasting, no sleep for the wicked, uh, up on our YouTube channel so you can see explorers and adventurers from around the world. It's a really, really special program, and I hope you guys get the chance to check it out. Similarly, we've also got our Backyard Bio Global Nature Campaign in its last and final week right now. So we are encouraging people, teachers, kids, everybody, to go outdoors and share pictures of all the amazing wildlife near them, sharing on social media with hashtag Backyard Bio, connecting with other groups worldwide on backyardbio.net, it's a great time. Hopefully you guys get the chance to take part. So this is our, our our first week back from our Global BioFest. Our brains have fallen out, but we're trying our best to, to keep it together. And what better uh, presentation to put our brains back in than to learn about A Beginner's Guide to the Brain by Dr. Emma Kinnell. So she is going to blow our minds today. I'm so excited. We always wonder when we do a program that's a little bit different than our, our usual fare, how many teachers will register? Well, you guys did not disappoint. We had over 100 classrooms from across Canada and the U.S. registered for today's program, and I know we've also got some students from Mr. Sharma's group all the way in India. So welcome in, uh, international community. I'm so excited to dive in with this presentation, and Dr. Emma, without further ado, if you want to come on in and join us, take us away. I'm so excited to hear from you today. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. That's amazing. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, today from all over the world. I'm so excited. Um, as Jesse said, welcome or croeso, as we say in Wales, because I'm in Wales today uh, in the UK. I'm actually in Cardiff. And I know some of you are very excited um, that I'm from Wales. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, but you should be able to see my slides on the screen now. And I'm going to run through today a beginner's guide to the brain because I've been a brain scientist um, now for about six or seven years and I've been working with people who have different brain diseases. So let's kick off and talk a little bit about the brilliant brain because hopefully we all have uh, a brain and it sits right in the center of our skull and for most adults and uh, maybe your parents or guardians or teachers it probably weighs about three kilograms. So I don't know how you feel about that. I don't think that's very much actually, when you consider all of the brilliant things that the brain does. Another fun fact about the brain is it contains over 100 billion brain cells in your brain right now. There's 100 billion of those cells. And as we maybe get a little bit older, the cells in our brain, we start to lose some, which is quite normal, actually. But sometimes in different diseases, we lose more brain cells than we should. And that is um, some of the science that I do. I work with people who have all sorts of different brain diseases. And we can maybe talk a little bit about that later. So hopefully um, the brain is a concept that you're relatively familiar with. You all know that your brain sits underneath your skull. If you give your head a nice gentle tap, you will have your hard skull protecting your brain from any damage. It's one of the reasons why you should absolutely wear a helmet if you ride a bicycle, because it protects your skull and also your brain. So that is the brain, but what does it actually do? When we think about it, what does your brain actually do? So the answer is loads of things. Maybe you can think of some of those things that the brain actually does. And we know that without our brain, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be alive and we wouldn't be able to survive. So as a brain scientist, I love the brain. It's my favorite organ of the body because it does so much stuff and loads of different things as well. So let's have a little look at this brain. So on the screen, you can see the front of the brain in a nice juicy pink color here. And you can see the back of the brain in green. 
And then you've got this um, bit at the bottom of the brain called the cerebellum. So let's have a little look at what all of these regions do. So at the front, just behind your forehead, is the region of the brain called the frontal lobe. And it's this region that helps you with thinking. So when you're kind of thinking about a really complex problem, it's this area of the brain that you will be using. There's different parts of the brain that do different things. So just behind that, we've got a region of the brain that helps you with walking and moving, a region of the brain that helps with your um, senses. So touch, for example. So if you go to touch your table and um, you might have, I've got a desk in front of me right now, I know that it feels quite hard. And then interestingly, the area of the brain that helps you to see is right in the back. Lots of people think it's just behind the eyes, but it's not true. Actually, it's right at the back of your head. And then we've got this bit that I haven't um, indicated, this bit called the cerebellum. It looks a little bit like a cauliflower, I think. That helps you to balance. We've got this area of the brain, the auditory cortex, sits just under your ears, uh, and that helps you to hear. And then for other regions of the brain, We've got parts that help you to smell uh, and sense your environment. And for those of you who may be a little bit chatty in lessons, we've got a region of the brain called Broca's area, and that helps you to speak. So when you're speaking, your brain is really important in allowing you to do that. So the brain's awesome. It allows you to do loads of amazing things. But sometimes our brains get poorly. And that's why I started this career in science to try and help people who are living with brain disease. So here we've got a picture of a real life human brain uh, where you can see the skull here. You can see a bit of skin uh, covering the skull. But right in the middle, you can see the big juicy brain. And the brain has got white matter that you can see here named because it looks quite white it has something called myelin in the brain and then you've got gray matter as well but when we think about brain disease and when the brain gets poorly there might be a bad bit for example a tumor we might have a problem with the brain like a bleed on the brain for example we need to think about how we actually get access to the brain because your skull is protecting your brain. That's a really important function of your skull. It's really quite hard and it can be really quite difficult um, to get through to give us access to the brain to try and help. So let's think about how we might be able to crack the skull um, in terms of helping people who have a problem with their brain. Now, we can have a little think about this. We might start with some fairly drastic solutions. We could use a saw, it's a possibility. We could use a drill. Um, this is a, a drill that I have at home for putting shells up, for example. Um, or more of a, a bigger drill that we might see on roads to do um, road kind of resurfacing. But actually, you could use all of these things um, and they do use drills in brain surgery. So my colleagues who are medical, not sciencey, medical people do do brain surgery. Um, but before we go into drilling through the skull, there's this amazing way that we can actually look inside the brain first. So you don't have to do anything to be able to get inside using this really cool scanning, we can look inside the brain. So this is our amazing MRI scanner. And MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So that's what we mean. Um, in the UK, we have a, a mint that looks like this shape. We call it a polo. And this is a giant magnet. Um, MRI machines are super expensive. They cost millions of pounds. Um, so they're very, very precious and special. And we can pop our patient on this bed here and put them into the scanner. Now, MRI scanners work because the scanner is a giant magnet. 
but not just any magnet it's a super super strong magnet so i'm talking 10,000 times the strength of the magnets you might have on your fridge really really super strong magnet and this uh, allows the molecules in the brain to kind of spin so that we can get an image of the brain through the scanner. But I told you that this scanner is amazing because it has this really strong magnet. So before we put anyone near the scanner, there's a few things that we have to go through which are super important for their safety. So before anyone goes near the scanner, we need to make sure they don't have any jewellery on them um, because it's metal and metal gets attracted um, to the magnet. We need to make sure they don't have any cash on them or any coins because that will um, fly out of their pocket. Any other things that they might have on them that include metal, so glasses. Um, although they're not really metallic, the strip along a credit card that can get absolutely wiped by a magnet. We don't want that to happen. But there's other things as well. So some people have devices or joint replacements which contain metal. Even some tattoos, um, depending on where they were done, um, can contain a metallic pigment. Normally for brain scanning, we only pop someone's head directly under the magnet. So it tends to be just um, tattoos on the face that can be problematic. Even in recent times, um, semi-permanent makeup. So some people choose to have makeup applied more permanently. That can contain metal pigments as well. So those are the things that people might have on them. And there's also some other things we need to think about. So, for example, there might be some chairs in the room next door to the scanner that contain metal legs. We don't want them accidentally going anywhere near and being dragged into the magnet. And finally, really important things like fire extinguishers. They are metal. So if they um, accidentally went near the scanner, there have been cases of people actually being killed by um, fire extinguishers that get sucked into the scanner. So really, really important for safety. Um, but also, you don't want to ruin the scanner. It costs millions of pounds. So if we accidentally took some metal near it, it would ruin and break our scanner, sadly. So this is what um, scanning looks like. Some of you may have had a scan before, others might not, but this is the giant magnet, that polo shape that I spoke about. And here we have somebody going into the scanner. And I'm just gonna play this video um, for you, just to be aware, it's not a nice noise, but I want you to um, know what noise the scanner makes. So let's give it a bit of a go and see whether you can hear this. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you heard that. I said it wasn't nice. Um, but that is the noise of the different magnets banging together. And for this reason, before we put people in the scanner, we offer them um, earplugs to make sure it doesn't affect their hearing. But also you might be able to see that there's not a lot of space in the scanner. And this means if people are claustrophobic or maybe have um, some anxiety, it can be a problem um, to go in the scanner. So we always check with people about that as well to make sure um, that they don't kind of panic or become upset by the process. Oh, there we go again. Um, this is what we see from the results of a scan. So right in the middle here, we have what we call a structural scan. So this shows us what the structure of the brain looks like. So you have the front of the brain here and the back of the brain here. Um, you can see these kind of holes in the middle of the brain. These are called ventricles. They're very normal. Lots of people get worried, but they're absolutely fine and normal. We can do other sorts of scans. So this is a PET scan, so positron um, emission tomography scanning. This involves some chemicals that are injected into the body. But MRI scanning just involves magnets. So no chemicals or radiation or anything like and then on the right of the screen over here, you've got something called a functional MRI. And what this shows is you can see different areas of the brain that are lighting up 
when people in the scanner are doing different tasks. So sometimes people are put in the scanner and they're asked to do different activities. So that might be speaking in a different language or doing some number puzzles or even watching films or computer games and different regions of the brain will light up. And that allows us as scientists to understand more about the wonderful brain. So, oh, I should have said, there's a, a bit of a warning here. I'm gonna show you some pictures now of different people who've had injuries to the brain, um, traumatic brain injuries. So these are injuries that they've sustained under quite traumatic circumstances. And these are people who we would not take anywhere near the MRI scanner. So here is the first picture of somebody who's sadly had a knife um, put into their brain. So you can see that this is a, a really horrible injury. This has gone through into the brain. Um, and as I said, nowhere near the scanner because this knife is, is metal and it would be sucked out if we did do that. What we do is ask our friends over in neurosurgery to remove this um, under surgery because it needs to be done quite carefully and quite delicately because there's potential of bleeding to the brain um, once this is removed. And then the next um, picture I've got for you is somebody who sadly sustained a very traumatic injury where they've had several nails go into their head. And Again, nails are metallic, so we wouldn't put them in the scanner. We'd look to remove these in surgery. Um, but yeah, some really horrible injuries, but um, we know more about the brain than we ever have done, but there is still so much to learn about the brain. And even as a brain scientist, there's loads that we still don't know. So I'm doing lots of research still to try and help people. So that is all from me. Um, thank you, or diolch, as we say in Wales. And I would love to hear all of your questions. Fantastic. What a neat presentation that was. And the feedback on YouTube has been tremendous. So that was awesome. If you want to come out of screen share, have a bit of a conversation with us. I've got you back here with me. Uh, we have over 15 other classes joining us on YouTube, full classrooms from across North America. So welcome into all our, our amazing folks here today, in addition to our, our live slew of groups. Uh, we've got some groups joining us for the very first time today, which is really exciting. So if you're new to exploring by the seat of your pants, that was a great presentation to kick it off on. All right, we're going to dive in with questions, folks. If you're on the YouTube chat bar, just share where you're joining from if you haven't already. Share your questions and we'll come to you. Uh, but I'm going to start with Mr. Hancock's class. Mr. Hancock has joined us for, I think, 9,000 broadcasts over the last five years uh, between astronauts and explorers, all sorts of things. But this is his first actually live in the session. So in Georgetown, Ontario, if you want to kick us off with a question, Mr. Hancock, come on yeah, in. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having us, Jesse. A uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, we've had a few students in my uh, Google Meet who are curious about uh, a newborn's brain, the size, how it develops, like where does the brain kind of start off? Because we saw like with the, your pictures where it can grow in all the different areas. I know holding my two children for the first time, um, the soft spot on the top was quite terrifying, but I knew with the skull and how that all worked. But if you could tell us a little bit about the newborn brain. Yeah. And Emma, you're muted, just so you know. You Thanks. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting how the brain develops. And actually, the brain develops quite early on um, in what we call the neural tube. So it is a tube that develops. Sometimes um, babies or children can have problems in the development of the brain. They can have something called fluid on the brain. That can happen if that process doesn't happen um properly but as you said the brain does develop over time um and there's also a section of the skull that doesn't quite fuse um until people grow up but actually we think the brain keeps kind of growing developing um until probably about the late 20s so loads of time for our brains to still develop that is really comforting to hear as a 29-year-old that there's still room to grow because I don't know, I've been having some trouble lately remembering things. Um, let's head to Ms. Rudder's class. They are joining us in Brampton, grade five class. Just unmute your mic and come on in. Hey. Hello, that's perfect timing. My students just asked a question. What tools other than scans are used for brain surgery, either to look at it or to fix the brain? Yes, yeah, so brain surgery is something that is really tricky um, and people take 
decades probably to train as brain surgeons. So when we were um, going in for a surgery, we would anesthetize the patient. And then depending on what needs to be done, so if, for example, a bit of brain needs to be removed, um, that can be removed or sucked out. If there's a problem like a bleed on the brain, and um, there's suction to suck it away. Um, but scanning is really important because that can tell us what's happened after the surgery as well. So scanning is, is a really nice tool. Um, there are others as well. So we can look under the microscope as well, looking at tiny regions of the brain. Um, and also sometimes sending that brain tissue away to the laboratories to see whether it's um, healthy tissue or whether it's a bit nasty. Very cool. Great question, Ms. Frederick's class. All right, let's go to Mr. Selwyn's class. They're joining us in Timmins. Uh, if you want to come on in, go for it. Hi there, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we were looking at some brain videos uh, earlier in the week. One of my questions, oh, one of my questions, Nicholas asked if, uh, why is why is it when we're happy or relaxed, is it easier to take in new information? Ooh, what a question. Good question. I like that one. Yeah, I love that question. So I think it's probably to do with the fact that we have lots of brain chemicals, right? So within the cells of our brain, they're releasing new chemicals all the time. And some of those chemicals are helpful for things like learning and memory. Um, so if you're really, really like uptight and stressed, your body isn't really designed to take in new information. So if I'm stressed, I might be feeling anxious, my heart is pounding, I'm sweating. All of my body's resources are going to that stress response because it's trying to protect me from danger, really. Um, if we're sad as well, it's kind of your body's response to protect you from a threat. But if you're happy and relaxed, your brain has more kind of energy and it can divert that to um, processing information and learning and storing those memories as well. So I think it's probably to do with that. Great question. That was a great question, great answer. It's really interesting stress as a topic in general has become a huge focus in medicine around the world because it really impacts everything, whether you want to exercise, whether you want to learn, all the things that are in our body that are affected by stress response. And so there's lots of ways that you can work to sort of mitigate that and then make that less, but I'm really glad it got brought up in the brain context today. So thanks, guys. All right, let's head to Ms. McKay's class there. Join us in Alliston. If you guys want to come on in, unmute that mic. You're good to go. Hey, Ms. McKay. Hey, thanks. Nice to see you. My class is wondering um, about, Rebecca and Chloe, you were wondering about the MRI machine and if you have an artificial limb. Rebecca was wondering, and um, Chloe was wondering how you got those photos if they couldn't go in the MRI machine. Can you ask that first question again? I didn't quite hear it. Yeah, it was about an artificial limb. If you have one, can you go in the MRI machines? They're just wondering about <gasps> things that would prevent you from getting in. Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, normally we would ask people to remove it um, before they go into the scanner. And then those um, second images, they were um, X-ray images. So they don't require any sort of magnets at all. And they work in, in a bit of a different way. Yeah, good question. All right, I'm going to go to a quick YouTube one before we go to Miss Penfold and Miss Lodge in a second. I love this question from Miss Coffee's class. They want to know where is the place in your brain where you keep your memories? Oh yes, great question. So the place in your brain um, that helps you with memories is called the hippocampus. Um, this is a, a word that's come kind of over time from history. Um, it translates as a, a seahorse, so it looks a little bit maybe like a seahorse, right in the middle, in the center of your brain. Um, and it's your hippocampus that helps you. So that is a region of the brain in some brain diseases. So dementia, for example, where people's memory gets affected, is that region of the brain that um, they have some problems with. Cool question, guys. This has been awesome. There's more questions. There's already more questions in YouTube than we can possibly answer in one broadcast, which is a great problem to have. Uh, I'm going to take one more, sort of a joint one from YouTube, and then we'll go to our live groups. So in Mr. Powell's class and Ms. DeBernardi's class, they want to compare human brains to animal brains. How big are animal brains? And specifically, how do elephant brains differ from humans, Emma? Yeah, so it depends on the animal, right? So... I'm thinking like um, the brain of a mouse or a cat or a dog is a little bit smaller. 
um, but an elephant brain is, is bigger than a human brain. And it really depends on what the animal does. So animals that have a really good sense of smell, so rodents, for example, to find food, um, they have really well-developed what we call olfactory regions of the brain, the brain regions uh, involved in smell. Whereas other animals, so I'm thinking something like an owl, um, needs to see. So the regions of the brain involved in um, vision will be bigger. Um, and elephant brains are really interesting. So generally, the kind of bigger the animal, the, the bigger the brain. But it's these frontal regions, these bits behind our, our forehead that make us kind of quite unique as humans, give us our defining characteristics like our thinking, our language skills. So it's this region of the brain that's bigger, particularly in the human, that other animals um, lack. But we see over time, the brain has evolved and, and developed. Awesome, guys. I'm so glad we got those questions. All right, I want to head to Miss Penfold's class in lovely Orangeville, Ontario. I love Orangeville. You guys have some great restaurants there. Uh, come on in. Uh, come on in. Uh, come on in. Uh, my class wants to know, uh, if you know the most common cause of brain injuries and also what part of the brain it affects most often. Mm, so brain injuries are interesting. So when we talk about traumatic brain injuries, these are injuries that are caused um, often from an accident. So things that might cause that um, typically are things like road traffic crashes, um, trauma, fighting. And because of when you, you look at the brain, Typically, that affects this region right behind the forehead. Um, but also, the region of the brain, I'm going to do a spin and see if you can see it, right here at the back. Um, if people fall backwards and they sometimes hit their head on the curb, that region of the brain um, can be impacted. And that would affect things like balance. Um, but it really depends on where the brain is hit, really. Um, the brain, we have de developed our skull, which is amazing, and it protects our brain an awful lot. But sometimes if there's a very traumatic um, event, our skull doesn't do its job properly. Um, so that's why we, we have that. I've always loved, uh, someone mentioned when I was a little kid, the analogy of, of the idea that we have the bigger structures to protect our most important organs sort of in order. We have the skull, the hardest thing that we have to protect our brain. Then we've got our sort of enhanced rib cage here with the sternum for our lungs and our heart, which are really important. And the lower down you go, it's important, but it's not near as important as those things that are pretty essential for life, like our brain. So very cool, guys. All right, Miss Lodge, I don't know if your devices are on, but oh, you're good. So come on in, unmute that mic, and you're, you're good to go. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so one of the students is wondering, does our brain grow? And if it does, will our skull grow? Yeah, so our brain does grow. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Our skull grows as well to help it. So we said earlier that when babies are born, they actually have a little bit of a hole in their skull, which is perfectly normal. And over time, that closes up. So you, you don't have that anymore. And um, your skull fully forms again. But I don't know if anyone has any like photos from when they were born or when they were a child, but your head is probably a bit smaller um, than it is now. But over time, it gets bigger. And we think it grows until about your kind of late 20s. Probably. Yeah. How neat is that? Um, guys, we're whipping through questions. Emily, you're like a champion answer. We need to have you on more often. Uh, we're going to have a, a whole other round with our live group. So I'm going to come back to Mr. Hancock um, and we'll keep this train rolling. Come on in. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Uh, we have a few students who are kind of curious along that that um, that train of thought with brain injuries. And do brain injuries affect younger uh, children different than adults? And what's kind of the healing process like compared to with uh, younger versus older? Uh, humans? Yeah, it's a great question. So when we look at the causes of traumatic brain injuries, so typically things like road traffic crashes, um, violence, sometimes as a result of alcohol consumption, happen um, in the kind of adolescent period. So we know that the brain has this awesome thing <clears throat> called plasticity. And that means that the connections between the different brain cells can reform and change over time. And we think that as people get older, they lose that ability. Um, but when I say older, I mean kind of quite old. Um, so your kind of prognosis or, or options are probably better um, earlier 
But the brain is amazing. And we know that people have lost um, sections of the brain. And actually, the brain has kind of rewired and kind of gone past that and is plastic enough to rewire. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is amazing in terms of people's recovery um, after brain injury often. One of my favorite things, I guess this started about 10, maybe 15 years ago, as a person who really loves science books and popular science books, is seeing all this, these stories coming out into the limelight. Uh, there's so many books out there. So if you guys want to keep the learning going, not only are there amazing researchers like uh, Emma, of course, but you can check out so many books, resources, online articles about things like plasticity. Visit is just so, so cool. It's like magic. It's amazing. I'm sure you get that to work with every day. Um, let's head back into Sparta's group. Come on in, guys, and take us away. Thank you so much. And Springdale gives a special shout out to Ms. Lodge. Um, our question is about dementia. Could you tell us a little bit more about dementia and how it affects the brain? Sure, yeah. So dementia is what we call an umbrella term. So that covers lots of different diseases that all affect memory. So dementia is, I think, the most common um, brain disease that you can get. So it covers things like Alzheimer's disease, um, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia. And dementia, what that means is that people's memory is affected. So dementia has a lot more other symptoms as well alongside that. So maybe um, changes in personality, um, people kind of not being who, who they once were. But dementia affects that region of the brain called the hippocampus that we mentioned earlier, that is where your memories are stored and processed. But as that disease progresses over time, um, the, the whole of the brain is really affected. So it can start off um, with problems with memory and spread to other regions of the brain as well. Yeah, dementia is a, a big one, a big disease to, to tackle. I figured we'd get dementia, a, a dementia question for anyone who's had a, you know, to live with dementia, maybe with a family member, uh, maybe themselves, and in, in some cases, people tuning into the broadcast uh, now or after. It's a really challenging disease. It's something that a lot of scientists are working on in a really meaningful way um, because it is so important. So if you have that personal experience, you'll know what that is a little bit like. Yeah, um, it's the, the reason I got into science, Jesse. My grandparents both had dementia. So yeah, yeah my kind of personal background story as well. I thought we were going to get that question from a teacher later, but that's fascinating. So you had grandparents with dementia when you were younger. How old were you when that happened? And what sparked the interest in there? Oh, well, really young, maybe like eight years old. Um, so I was really conscious that when I was younger, um, I thought doctors could, could treat everything. Um, dementia, unfortunately, doesn't have a cure at the moment. So we're working hard to try and change that. Um, but um, and make people kind of more comfortable with that condition. Um, but it isn't treatable at the moment. So I wanted to become a brain scientist to try and help other people um, and their families as well. So Jesse mentioned, you know, that is um, difficult for the, the person who's suffering from that condition, but also for their wider family um, as well, particularly with the brain. So much of us is associated with our brain, isn't it? So when we have a problem with it, it's a very kind of personal um, condition and a personal disease. Yeah, I think it's it's worth noting, you know, for me with uh, dementia in my family, it was interesting trying to think of the fact that, you know, it's not something that you can necessarily help as you're dealing with it. It's like telling someone with no arms to grab something on a tire, taller shelf to tell someone with dementia, oh, you know, try and remember that thing because they, they simply can't. So that's a, quite the, the story and a, a, amazing that it started when you were eight. A lot of our students are eight today, so I think that's really cut home for a lot of people. Speaking of brain injuries, I think this is a really important question on YouTube and I want to share it. Uh, Mr. Powell wants to know. Would you possibly explain why it's important for a child to report hitting their head to an adult as quickly as possible and the signs of a concussion? Yeah, absolutely. So with things like um, hitting your head, some of the symptoms of that um, can be masked for a little bit of time. And it's only after that the, the real problems hit home. So if you hit your head, it's really important to tell somebody and then they can seek kind of medical attention. So. Um, in Wales, where I am today, um, we play lots of rugby. Um, I love to watch rugby and there's been lots of work on head injuries in rugby um, and problems with that and people reporting that and going off the field um, and not playing in the game anymore. So really important because time is really important. So the quicker you tell somebody, the more close they can monitor you. Um, and you may well be absolutely fine, but it's really important for somebody to keep checking in on you just to make sure that you are going to be absolutely fine and to keep a little eye on you. 
I think that's such an important question. So thank you for Mr. Powell. Here in Canada, of course, we've all seen this with hockey. Hockey is a very different sport than it was 10 years ago because of this understanding of concussions and how important they are. Um, and so I think that that's a really important message for all our kids and teachers to take home today. Um, Mr. Sullivan, if you want to come back in for another question, you are good to go. Uh, hi there. Uh, great information thus far. One of my students just asked me, um, do uh, folks with autism have different looking brains than uh, folks without autism? We have an autism program in our school, and we're just curious about that a little bit. Yeah, great question. So autism is a really interesting condition in that um, I have colleagues who are doing lots of research into what causes it, and we, we don't know, really. Um, there's probably likely to be genetic and environmental factors. We know particularly in girls, um, autism might be underdiagnosed because girls tend to be better at mimicking their social groups. Um, but in terms of the brain, it's something we're still investigating. I don't think we're really sure um, yet. I don't think there's any really clear differences that you would pick up on something like a scan like that. But it's probably to do with the way the connections between the cells are forming um, rather than the, the brain overall. Uh, a book that I read that was particularly impactful on autism, the history of it, the understanding of it was called Neurotribe. So I just wanted to bring that into the broadcast if you want to check that out. Uh, a lot of our teachers may know too, Temple Grandin is probably the most well-known autistic person in the world for some of her amazing work with animals. So I'd encourage you to learn a little bit more about her too if you're, if you're keen on this as a topic. All right, Ms. McKay, come on back in. We are having the best time. This is so much fun. <laughs> uh, so much fun. <laughs> My students were wondering, is there a particular part of the brain that's easier to injure? Um, they're wondering, you know, and, and we've been talking about how our brain changes and we can do hard things. So if you could talk about that. Yeah. So in terms of which pieces of the brain or bits of the brain are, are more easy to injure, um, so really your, your forehead is kind of, you know, a bit of a target, really. Um, I, if you feel kind of on the back of your head, right right down at the bottom of your skull, um, down there as well, so particularly if you fall backwards. Um, but it's really interesting you should mention um, doing things that are hard. So, you know, when you, you kind of think, oh, you know, I don't want to do that, it's too difficult, you know, I'm going to give up. But actually, we know the more you challenge yourself and the more you try, the easier it becomes. So some of my work is around um, brain training and challenging the brain and doing the same thing over and over again. And we know that eventually it will become easier. So those connections within the brain will fire and they will um, allow the brain to, to do the hard task. And those connections get stronger and stronger and stronger um, until you get better at it. So really important if you have got, you know, a, a task that you think, you know, this is really difficult and this is challenging keep going determination is key um and also the sense of achievement that you'll get once you complete it right that's that's really good for the brain too you mentioned training the brain uh, one of our only other brain programs we've ever had on this broadcast was dr tobias hauser a few months back and he talked about his brain explorer app so check out tobias hauser on our youtube channel if you want to see that i think it's a really nice follow-up to this and has some games and activities that you guys can do with your smartphone from home to help train the brain and some really fun activities so and, uh, take a look and check it out. Um, we're going to take like three more questions here. Time flies and we're having fun. I told you this would fly by. Huh? Um, so Miss Penfold's group, do you want to come in? I'll take one from YouTube and wrap up with Miss Lodge to end the broadcast. Miss Penfold, good morning. Thank you. Um, my students would like to know more about the holes that you mentioned in our brains early on. Like, do they have a purpose? Are they different depending on the person? Stuff like that. Yeah, so the ventricles in our brain, um, they have this really special fluid inside them. So it's a bit like um, water. It's called cerebral spinal um, fluid, and it bathes the brain, it gives the brain all the, the nutrients it needs. And you have that in your um, spinal kind of column as well. So the function of um, those ventricles is to produce that fluid so that the brain is bathed in it and gets all of the things that it needs. I love this next question from you too, from Mr. Thwaites class, uh, grade eight students that are very much close to what I would have been asking in grade eight, which is <laughs> what happens to the brain after you die? Can you still gather information from a stopped brain? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
It depends, really. So um, some people are really generous and kind and they choose when they're when they're living. They choose to donate their brains to science and give their brains to scientists. And then we can look at those um, brains and learn more and teach other students and learn more about it. Um, once the, the brain stops, once the body stops, once somebody does die, um, sadly that it degrades. So the tissues um, get broken down and it's the same for the brain. So if we want to preserve a brain, we have to really pickle it, um, put it in special chemicals. That means the tissues don't break down. So we can learn a lot from the brain after people have died, um, particularly if they, they choose to give their, their brain to science. Um, a more interesting question is how long it takes for the brain to stop after someone's died. So when somebody is died, they're declared um, brain dead. That means all of the functions of the brain have stopped. Um, and right at the top of the spinal cord, the bottom of the brain, the brain stem is the region um, that doesn't function anymore. That means somebody is, is declared brain dead. Um, so yeah, really still loads to learn, um, even though someone may have died. Yeah, there was really, I mean, it's sort of macabre, but really interesting research research done in the early days when, you know, there were more executions when they were trying to assess if someone could still think or do stuff uh, after they died, which is really, really neat sort of a, a, a interesting follow-up to the knife and nail bit at the end, which really did impact a lot of children. So thank you for that. I mean, that was a very cool <laughs> picture to, to wrap up the broadcast. Um, I want to head to Ms. Lodge for one final question, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up from there. So come on in, Ms. Lodge. Hello, thank you so much. We want to shout out back to Mrs. Ryder's class. So that's from my grade fives. Um, and we just had a question about when we sleep and dream, how is the brain connected to all of that? Yeah, so sleep is a really interesting area of research that lots of my colleagues are still exploring. So we know that we need sleep. We know that without it, um, we become poorly. We know if we didn't get any sleep at all, we would die. So it is really important. I'm sure we've all experienced maybe we've had like a poor night's sleep or have been able to get to sleep and we feel quite groggy the next day and maybe you can't pay attention as much and concentrate um the the functional purpose of sleep is really interesting so particularly as children um you grow a lot in your sleep so that's really important but what the brain does in sleep is something that we still aren't really sure about so we know that the brain is still functioning it's probably functioning to a lower degree than it is while, while you're awake. Um, but what it actually does, we still don't know. So some scientists think that your memories are kind of processed and almost kind of stored in filing cabinets while you sleep, theoretical filing cabinets in your brain. Um, others kind of think that that's um, the time where kind of energy is, is needed. So your brain is still active when you're sleeping. Um, lots of people ask me about the function of dreams. What what's the purpose of a dream? Um, and that's something we're still exploring as well. So in Cardiff, where I work, we actually invite people into the university for a sleepover and we can study their brain. We can put electrodes on their brain um, while they're sleeping to monitor what's actually happening in there. Isn't that fantastic? I would absolutely love to be part of a study like that. And I love that this thing that is a third of our lives, eight hours of our 24 hour day is spent sleeping and we still don't truly understand it. I think that the most amazing thing about science in general is that there's so much to learn. There's so many new mysteries to explore. And so for our kids today, whether you're keen to just follow up with what's going on in the world or become scientists yourselves, uh, the exploration is just beginning. Emma, this has been so, so much fun. Thank you so much for sharing your, your time and enthusiasm with us today. Is there a place that our kids could go to learn more? Again, we've got more questions than we can possibly answer them on broadcast. Where do we send folks to keep learning going now that they're done? Oh, there's so much to learn, isn't there? So um, I'm in the UK, so there's lots of really interesting resources online. I'm sure you guys have kind of ones that your teachers can recommend. Um, but generally, just keep looking. You know, if you're interested in something, just pop it into a search and, you know, Check out some videos, check out some, you know, documents. Um, have a think about, you know, that you can get these freely available online. I can send a link maybe to pass it around to you, Brain Hats, where you can download a brain hat and make it um, for yourself. So maybe we can get that information out, hopefully. Um, so yeah, loads, loads to learn. As Jesse said, there's still loads that we don't know. So you could keep researching this um, forever. So if you do find it interesting, just um, keep researching it. 
You send me absolutely anything, and I will make sure all our teachers that are registered get that. So please do that. It would be great. I'm um, hoping to end every broadcast. I know we've got some new, you know, you're new to this today. We've got some new teachers joining us today. What we do to end every broadcast, everybody, is I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell alongside me. So, Miss Rudder, Mr. Selden, Miss McKay, Miss Michelle, Miss McKay, Miss Rudder, 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 Miss Rud